Matthew 13, verse 44. And Jesus told this very simple parable. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. It's a simple enough story, isn't it? It uh, actually forms one of seven parables that Jesus told at this time. And uh, you'll, you'll find them uh, here, the sower, um, or we looked at that one the other week, and we said it might be better called the parable of the soils, because it's really about the four different types of soil more than the sower himself. But um, uh, the soils, the sower, that, that's one of them. Then there's the weeds. You may remember the story, uh, the parable of the weeds, and that one, a bit similar really to the sower, um, or the soils, in that, um, again, you've got this farmer, he goes out and he sows um, seed in the ground, but an enemy comes along and he sows some weeds. And as they grow together, they look really, really similar. And uh, so he says, leave them till they fall, uh, both full grown and then you'll tell the difference. Um, uh, just as an aside on that, I was walking across a wheat field yesterday and the wheat is, you know, I don't know, probably six inches tall, something like that. And as I was looking at it, I was thinking how it just so resembles the tufts of grass that were along the pathways as well. Um, uh, in fact, the, 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 the weeds were probably something else called darnel, but it, looks very, but it just reminded me that actually if, if you'd put tufts of grass next to, the, to that wheat, I was looking and thinking you'd have to have a very keen eye to see the difference. But of course, when wheat is fully grown, it looks so different to tufts of grass, doesn't it? So, um, so that was a second one that he told. He then told a third one um, uh, about mustard seed. Um, you know, the mustard seed is it's the smallest of the seeds, and yet it grows into uh, this great big bush, a tree almost. And uh, he said, even the birds sit in it. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hang on a minute, I remember, you know, at school just sowing little mustard seeds, and it only got to, you know, about that tall. How on earth did the birds sit in that? Well, I think it was a different type of plants than what we know as mustard or cress today. So, uh, but you've got that one. The parable of the yeast. And the parable of the yeast was the fact that if you take a great big batch of flour and you put a little bit of yeast in it, it really doesn't take very much. I'm actually quite a keen bread maker. Um, so uh, I, I'm always amazed at the wonder of how just such a little bit of yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And uh, so he told that one about the kingdom of heaven. These are all about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, then he tells uh, the one that we're going to look at today. And then after that, there's a parable of a pearl, um, which we'll look at next week. Then there's a parable of a net, the last one. Now, if you don't know who a net is, um, she was a lovely lady. Okay, all right, bad joke. Um, <laughs> The parable of the net, and uh, he tells a story. I mean, a lot of them were fishermen, and they certainly understood the fishing principle and how the dragnet um, uh, brings in all kinds of fish. And But actually, that, that's the culmination of it all, because having talked about the kingdom of God and, and the different people who are in it, he finally brings it to a judgment day. And that's what the parable of the net is all about. So let's come back, though, and look at today's one. Treasure hidden in a field. Yesterday I was um, scouring through the BBC News website and I just happened to see a story of a man who found hidden treasure. And he's a very keen metal detectorist, or whatever you call people who use metal detectors. And I don't know if anybody else saw the story, but I was just amazed. I mean, the guy is obsessed with metal detectors. Now, Metal detectors, see, I can remember uh, when I was kind of, I don't know, probably just pre-teens, maybe a teenager, loads of people had metal detectors. They were the, the in thing to have. Everybody had metal detectors, except me, that is. Um, but I do remember um, uh, that, that a friend in the church had a metal detector, 
And we had great fun with this thing, just going around and uh, had these little headphony things on um, as we're going around, just listening for uh, the right sound and hoping that we were going to find our, our fortune going around his back garden. Um, the fact that he'd probably done it a million times before probably meant that we weren't going to find much in his back garden, frankly. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, you know, you, you can hope, can't you? Well, this guy, he's still using metal detectors and he goes out, I think it said he, he goes out something like 20 to 30 hours a week with his metal detector. That's how keen he is. And what he does is he very often goes uh, to a place and, you know, he'll find somebody with some land, um, just go knock on the door and say, would you mind if I just, you know, go over your field? with my metal detector. And most people don't mind, you know, if you're not doing any damage, they're, they're quite happy for it. And so he did this on this one particular place, and as he's going around, he, he got the, the little sound that you get to tell you there's something uh, on, under the ground. And so he started to dig, and he dug out um, a coin. And uh, he knew that it was a medieval coin. That's the first thing. He was so excited. I love the way it says that as he dug it out of the ground and he kind of rubbed the dirt off it, etc., and he realized that it was a medieval coin and very rare, he said, I was jumping up and down with joy. Uh, and he didn't even know what it was at the time. Well, it turns out that it was a Henry VII coin. Now, does anybody know when Henry VII lived? Does it, come on, all you history buffs, what were his dates? Before I have to tell you. Nobody know? You can look it up on your phones if you want to. Because I actually forgotten when it was. <laughs> or at least I should say, I for, well, I've forgotten, but I forgot to look it up as well. He was before Henry VIII, though. I can tell you that much. He was the first of the Tudors, and um, so Henry the Seventh. So he goes back a long way, probably fourteen something or other, and he found this coin, uh, and it's a gold coin. It turns out, and uh, I mean, it gives you pictures of it all polished up, which I probably should have put on the screen for you, but never mind. Um, and, uh, and it's this beautiful, glistening gold coin. Now it's all been polished up, and apparently, uh, you know, it's worth about four thousand pounds. Um, now, probably somebody dropped it, you know, six, seven hundred years ago, uh, and, um, and it's just sort of laid there and buried, and then I suppose over time, earth shifting, etc., it's made its way towards the surface again. But just think of that, it's been laying there all those hundreds of years, nobody had actually found it, and then he found it. Well, he's very fortunate because the owner of the land said to him he could keep the coin, um, so that was really generous of him. Um, and uh, so and he doesn't want to sell it. He says he, he's got a, a growing collection of things that he's found, but this is going to be the prize in his collection, this Henry VII coin, gold coin. Now, actually, apparently, um, if you find uh, treasure um, uh, anywhere in, I don't know if it's the whole of Britain, but certainly in England and Wales, I'm not sure about, about Scotland whether the law's the same there or not, and Ireland, but you have to notify the coroner, um, uh, and uh, it actually becomes public um, treasure, uh, and then they decide uh, what happens with it after that. But, um, but that's what you have to do, but apparently he's fortunate enough because if you find a single coin, that's all right. You don't have to declare that one. So apparently he's registered it with some register of, of uh, historical artifacts, but, um, but he can keep the coin. So uh, what a fortunate man he is. But I thought it was just a timely piece of news as I was thinking uh, over this little parable, a parable of treasure hidden in a field. I suppose you might ask the question, first of all, why on earth would anybody hide, uh, in any case, treasure in a field? I mean, why would you do that? Well, I mean, I think the first thing is that this was common. 
And uh, so I actually found something in Deuteronomy that talked about it was a blessing, actually, you know, that uh, Jacob's sons were all blessed. And as they get their individual blessing, it's fascinating to see the blessing that was given to Zebulun as recorded uh, in Deuteronomy. And he talks in there about the treasures. Yours will be the treasures hidden in the sand. And uh, so it was a common thing. People would hide their treasure in, in sand or in the earth. Why would they do that? Well, the reason is because there was a lot of war that took place. Israel was a crossroads, if you like, and people used to come from north and south and east and west, and they'd kind of all meet in the middle, and uh, Israel would take the brunt of all the fighting very often. And so people were uh, in fear of losing everything they owned to the ravages of war because the enemy would come in, they would ransack the place and any treasures they could find, they would carry off uh, for themselves. It was no good leaving it on the surface. Um, I also read um, uh, yesterday, I think it was uh, the former uh, president of Sudan, maybe you saw this too, uh, and uh, he was uh, um, deposed from power a little while ago. Um, but um, the authorities that have now kind of taken over were searching through his palace and have apparently found um, uh, absolutely millions and millions of dollars, euros, and Sudanese pounds um, stashed away in suitcases. Um, absolutely millions that he was storing there. You see, now, if the chap had taken biblical advice and buried it in the ground, they may not have found it. Um, but instead, he left it in his spare room or something. Um, and so they've now discovered it all and uh, um, I think he might have been up to something perhaps um, not totally legal. I wonder what gives them that idea. Um, but anyway, um, but burying it in the ground meant that when the military came in and took over your, your town or whatever, they wouldn't find your treasure, so they hid it in a field. Now, I know that we often think about treasure, don't we, as being associated with uh, pirates and um, treasure islands and, and, you know, maps with an X marked on it, um, you know, five paces from the tree. Uh, to the left, um, four paces to the north, you know, whatever, you know. So um, that's how we associate. But these were real treasures that people buried in the ground. And they would bury them deep in the ground where nobody would find them. The question is then, why on earth was this treasure left in the ground? Why had somebody not come back for it? The fact that the man went and bought the field where he discovered the treasure might suggest to us that the treasure didn't belong to the current owner of the field because if it did I think he'd be back out there first of all dig up his treasure before he let the field go now this was some somebody previously who had owned it we're not told it's a story so we don't need to know the details exactly but fairly commonly what would happen is that somebody would bury their treasure then maybe they would die or they'd um, go off to war and get killed or whatever it might be and the treasure was forgotten about um, maybe nobody actually knew it was there and so it would just lay there waiting for somebody in the future to come along and find it so then people say, but wasn't the man being dishonest? I mean, it wasn't his field after all. So um, shouldn't he actually have gone to the man who owned the field and said, I found some treasure in your field? Um, why did he not do that? Well, no, he's not being dishonest either. I mean, we might think of him being dishonest today because, quite frankly, if you happen to be out uh, in somebody else's property and found something on their property, then, yeah, the honest thing would be to go and to tell the owner um, that you found it on their property. But um, rabbinic law said differently. It said that if you found scattered fruit, for example, so if you're apples fall off the tree and somebody comes along and finds it on the ground then it's um, you know fair game uh, anyone can come and take it can't take it off the tree but you can pick it up off the ground and likewise if you find treasure that fair game because the treasure if it doesn't belong to the person uh, who owns the land it's 
it's no more theirs, the person who owns the land, than it is yours who found it. So therefore, it was also considered as fair game. It's yours if you want it. And this man saw his opportunity. Uh, we don't know how he found the treasure. He's probably plowing in the field. He's probably a laborer, which means that he's on a very uh, um, poor wage, denarius a day probably. How much is that? Um, well, you know, a day's wage um, uh, for, you know, a denarius, we find that in another uh, parable that Jesus told. But, you know, I mean, that's not very much at all, even by today's standards. It's not very much money. He's a laborer. He's on the minimum wage that he could get away with. And uh, yet he's found something of great value. So what does he do? He buries it deep in the ground again. And he goes off and he has to uh, sell everything that he has uh, in order to go and buy that field. Um, it's probably going to be for a laborer a big cost, a big sacrifice. But he manages to get the money together and then he goes to the owner of the field and he buys it. Now it's a fictional story so we mustn't read into too much but I do just kind of wonder what the owner might have thought if one of your laborers who's been out there plowing your field suddenly comes back and says, at any price I'm buying your field from you. Uh, you know, I think if I was the landowner, I might be sort of putting two and two together. Hang on a minute, he's out there ploughing. Now he wants to buy the field. You know, I, I think he might have struck something out there as well. So I might have gone digging myself, actually, or ploughing the field myself um, to see what was out there. But um, in the story, he buys it. It's cost him everything, but he buys it. It says that in his joy... He went and sold all he had. This was no hardship to sell everything that he had and to go and buy that field back. And in buying the field, yes, it's cost him so much, but in buying the field, he's gained so much more. And having done that, you know, I don't know what he's going to liquidate the treasure maybe um, so that he'll be able to recoup the costs of everything that he sold in the first place. And, um, you know, I, I, I can just imagine that his wife was, was, you know, probably distraught at the very idea that, you know, he was selling everything in sight um, and having a garage sale or something and everything was going, you know. But when she realized that no longer did she have to shop at Ikea, um, she must have been overjoyed as well um, to replace all of uh, the furniture and everything that he'd sold. So I should think he was overjoyed too that there were no more flat packs. So, but anyway, what has this got to do with Easter? Um, because I, you know I've 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 sold it to you if you like as being uh, appropriate for today. And as I looked at that, I thought um, you know as, as we try to understand, you know what does it what does it actually mean? We've kind of looked at what does it say and. Uh, a few of the details there, but what does it, what does it actually mean? What's, what's the message that Jesus is trying to tell in this parable? And how, uh, for today, might we relate that as well? Well, I think the first thing to note is that, uh, obviously, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. So, therefore, he's saying that someone who discovers the kingdom of heaven, the riches of it, the truth of the kingdom of heaven, the truth of, of what it means to be following Jesus and to be part of his uh, kingdom, his rule, because we said the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, interchangeable, means the same thing, is anywhere where the rule of Christ is established. So it starts here on earth. The kingdom of heaven is now. And it continues for all of eternity, so the kingdom of heaven is also not yet. It's something that's growing and building, and, and it's a work in progress. And what we see at the moment actually is merely the foundations of it. Everything we see on this earth is God building the foundations of his kingdom. But there's something much, much more glorious I always think that um, the preparation work that you do for any big job is, is always the, the hardest bit. Uh, many of us have not had uh, much building experience, so we probably um, don't know what it's like to, to just dig the foundations and just lay them and just see this you know, rather bland concrete 
drying, you know, and just think all that hard work and that's all we've got. But as something starts to rise out of the ground and it starts to take shape and, you know, that must be, you know, when it gets a bit more exciting. It's the same, isn't it, if you're into decorating. If you've ever done any decorating, you know that the preparation work that you do in order for decorating is absolutely uh, soul-destroying sometimes. You can spend hours and hours and hours just getting those walls prepared and ready to take the paint. Just getting everything so it's back to what it needs to be before you start again. And sometimes people feel like giving up even before they start. But once you actually start then to, to, to turn it into the dream that you imagined and it's starting to look neat and tidy and, and, and vibrant again, then it's exciting to see it all once more. Well, the kingdom of heaven that God is building here on earth, if you like, is just like the foundations. That this is just the beginning. We've hardly seen anything yet. But there's something so much greater still to come. But it's important to get this groundwork done. So the kingdom of heaven starts now. And for individuals here upon this earth, we might be going about our business, everyday business, just like this man was, and then stumble upon the kingdom of heaven. Now you see, the thing is that there are so many ways you might stumble upon it. Because when we want to kind of look at this and say, well, what does that mean exactly? How do we discover it? It seems to me it's just like the, the person who has that story of, of how they came to Christ. And, you know, they weren't seeking God at all. We're going to see a contrast there in the next parable next week with the, the merchant looking, looking for pearls. Okay, But this guy, he's not looking. He's just going about his everyday business when, bam, suddenly his plow hits something. And, you know, he stops and, and he says, well, what was that? And he looks down deeper into it and discovers something of so great value. And the same is true in life, that we can go through life enjoying it. Suddenly we hit something. For some of us, it's a disaster. You know, I mean, it's, it's an absolute disaster that we hit. Life is falling apart. And it's at that point that suddenly we discover Jesus. For some of us, it's not a disaster at all. It's not any trauma that we're going through. For some people, it can just be you're going through life and suddenly you just feel, I don't know, empty. It's just like, what am I here for? A lot of people are like that. You just kind of feel that, you know, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve in life. And, and you know, whereas I thought that, that, you know, life was going to be so much better than it is. And now I seem to have plateaued and... And I've kind of reached the heights of where I'm going to get to in my job, maybe. And, and you know, and I've done what I want to. I don't know, maybe get married, got a family, whatever it might be. And now suddenly you're just looking and saying, but what now? Do I just sit here for the next 20, 30, 40 years, twiddling my thumbs and just waiting to die? Is, is that all there is to it? It causes people to think and say, but there must be more to it than this. For some people, it's just a conversation. We might call it a chance conversation. I don't believe it is chance, but to us it seems like chance. That we're just talking to somebody and, and, and they suddenly say something to us that just sparks something within us and wakens something inside of us that makes us say, hey, hang on a minute. I need to know more about that. What is this you're talking about? Tell me more. And suddenly we, we warm inside ourselves as we, we hear the good news of Jesus. That, of course, was the, uh, the testimony of the Wesleys, wasn't it? That my heart was strangely warmed as he read Romans. And that's sometimes also something that happens. It may not be through a person. Sometimes it can be directly through Scripture either reading directly from the Bible or uh, an isolated scripture taken out that you see somewhere. I've heard of people saying, you know, I was just standing waiting for the train and there opposite was something written up on a billboard, some Christian text straight out of scripture that just hit me like a bolt between the eyes. That's not unheard of by any means either. But whatever it is, These people are not searching for it, and suddenly they stumble upon the treasure. 
Now, the thing is, you've got to recognize the treasure. I gave you the, the story of the man um, that uh, was in the news yesterday. Um, you know, he might have picked up that coin, and if he hadn't been such a keen person of, of going around with his, his metal detector and, and understanding these things, he might have just thought, oh, it's nothing, and kind of almost thrown it away. It's just like a dirty old coin, probably from last century, maybe the beginning of last century, and it's battered around a bit where perhaps it's been plowed over a few times or something. He might have discarded it, but he actually recognized it as being something of value. He didn't know what it was exactly, but he knew it was medieval. He knew it was of interest. He knew it was probably of some value. He just didn't realize to what extent. Didn't even realize, I think, at first that it was actually gold. And sometimes people are like that with the kingdom of God when they discover it. Some people don't recognize it for what it is. They don't understand the true value of it. And so they discard it again. And others, thankfully, have the insight to see this is something, something worth paying dearly for. I want it at whatever the cost. What is that cost? We're told that the man went away and in joy sold everything. I started to think about that. And I hit a bit of a problem. Because as I started to think about if I was put in that position, and let's just suppose I've been ambling through life, and then suddenly someone told me about Jesus, and I thought, wow, I actually quite like the sound of this. I like the sound of, of leaving the life that I've got behind and having something of so, so much greater value and wealth. I fancy uh, following after Jesus with all my heart. Then I thought, so what do I sell? And I started looking around my home at anything of value and then discovered what a poor person I am. I don't think anyone would pay anything for what I've got. <laughs> There's not much there. Not many treasures. But let's just suppose then that I do go to the car boot sale with, with whatever I've got. And I'm going to try and sell it. And let's just suppose that, you know, I've got a, a vase that was given to us as a, as a, a wedding present. And I take it and I put it on the table at the car boot sale and... And somebody comes along and, and you know, and I, I convince them that it's actually a Ming vase. Um, you know, and let's suppose that they give me absolutely thousands and thousands of pounds for my supposed Ming vase. Um, and lots of other stuff that I sell like that. And that, that I actually end up, by liquidating everything I've got, that I end up actually with hundreds of thousands if not millions of pounds in my pocket at the end of the car boot sale actually if you get millions of pounds at one car boot sale i mean you've done really well because i'm not actually sure anybody brings that kind of money with them but but anyway let's just suppose you do i then thought to myself now what do i do with it do i take my millions of pounds i've just got from the car boot sale and kind of i don't know what do i do do i bring it to church and kind of lay it at the front there and say there you go lord He doesn't need my millions of pounds, no matter how much it is. Um, scripture says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, I know you might not think that sounds very, um, uh, you know, kind of the language that we might use to describe somebody of wealth today, but back then it was. I mean, that's how you measured your wealth. It was how much uh, head of, of stock that you've got. And it says not that he's got a thousand cattle, but a thousand hills full of cattle. It says he owns it all anyway. I mean, what can you possibly give to him that he's already given to you first? I mean, it's all from him anyway. And so I thought there is nothing materially that I can give to God that he's going to say, in exchange, I'll give you the kingdom. See, we do give to God. We give to him materially. We give to him of our time. But ne never does he say, in exchange, I give you eternal life. That never happens. You can't buy it. 
So I thought, well, if it's no good liquidating all the, the tap that I've got to see if I can just raise a few pounds and give to him, that's not going to work. So what can I give? The only thing that you've got that is of value to him is yourself. It's you. And so what happens is that, and this is how redemption works, is that you actually have become a slave. You might not feel like that, but actually the Bible says that you're already in slavery. We all are. When we're born into this world, we're slaves to sin. That means that we can't get away from sin, that it's got a grip on us. But actually that we have to be sold ourselves. And what we do is we are sold to him. This is the amazing thing, is that he actually pays the price. So when I find the treasure, I need to give away everything I've got in order to buy back the treasure. And the only one that I can actually sell to in order to buy it is back to the Lord himself. So I come to him and say, the only thing I've got that's of any value is who I am. It's me. Now, you may not see yourself as a valuable person, but to him you are. That's why scripture says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now, when it says he so loved the world, it does not mean that he loves the structure of the world, that he loves particular spots of the world, that he loves the beauty of the world, although I'm sure that he does. But what he means by that is the people of this world. That's what he loves so much. And I can prove that to you because there is coming a day, and I don't think it's too far away, when God who made this world is going to destroy this world. I'm sorry to say that to all the eco-warriors around. Maybe I should go up to London and tell the protesters. But, um, but this world they're trying to save, God is going to destroy doesn't mean to say you should destroy it, I hasten to add, but God is going to destroy it in his time. And then he's going to make it again. And he's going to make Mark 2, and it's going to be much better. And he's going to make Mark 2 because he wants a place then that is absolutely perfect, that won't need uh, eco-warriors because there's going to be no problems with it. And instead, he's going to place us who are made perfect in him to inhabit his new world. Isn't that great news? I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but you know I just got to tell you that. It's such exciting stuff. But in the meantime, in the meantime, here I am stuck here with treasure that I've discovered and I need some way of getting hold of the treasure. And the only way to get hold of the treasure is to, to buy it in its lot, if you like, in the field. And the only way I can possibly do that is to sell what I have of value, that's me. And the only person who's prepared to pay the price for me is the Lord himself. What is the price? You'll be thankful to know that the price for you is not 30 pieces of silver. Because if it was, as indeed was the price on Jesus' head, 30 pieces of silver would not buy this field. Judas bought a field for 30 pieces of silver in which he hung himself in shame and disgrace at what he had done in betraying the Lord himself. But this field is of much greater value. 30 pieces of silver isn't going to do it. So the Lord says, I'm not going to give you 30 pieces of silver for your head. I'm going to give you something much more valuable. I'm going to give me. Hang on a minute. No, no, no. I came to give me, you say to the Lord. And he says, no, no, no. I'm giving me. No, no, me. No, no, me. No, no, me. Me, me, you know. And you've got this exchange going on with the Lord. You're trying to give yourself to him, and he's trying to give himself to you. And finally, you realize that there is only one way that if you are to get what is required in order to buy the treasure that actually you have to sell yourself and the price is him. That's 
where he goes to the cross. That's where he gives up his very life. And his life is so much more valuable than yours because he is perfect. He's without fault. And you know, let's just keep using the treasure analogy for a moment, that you know from, uh, you know, experience possibly, uh, or watching Antiques Roadshow, or whatever it is that you do, or Bargain Hunt, or whatever it is, you've seen it before, haven't you? Where somebody brings this fine thing, and they bring it to the expert, and the expert is absolutely agog over it. Wow, wonderful. 16th century, very rare, only five of them were ever made, and <gasps> there's a chip. And as soon as they see the chip, oh, but that will affect its value. You're full of chips. You're full of cracks. You're full of imperfections. Your value is so low in that sense. And yet his value is so high because he's the perfect one. And he says, no, he says, to me, you're worth every drop of blood. Every drop of blood. I'll buy you back. And so in buying us, we then have the price, if you like, in order to gain the kingdom. And then we discover that actually what we've actually done there, in fact, is we've bought the treasure. We might not have realized at the time, but when we sold ourselves to the Lord and we became his servants, literally his slaves, when we became under his rule, thinking that we were getting ready to buy the treasure, we discovered that we've now got the treasure. Because the treasure is, in fact, him. He is the treasure. And when we find Jesus, we found the kingdom. When we serve him, we're then in the kingdom. That is what the treasure is all about. The treasure that was hidden in a field, I believe, if you found it, you were meant to find it. And if you were meant to find it, then absolutely be assured that if you're prepared to take that treasure or to, to buy that treasure at any cost, then you will get the right price. And if you get the right price, then that's great too, because actually you'll find that you're resourced beyond imagination, not with physical money and resources and material things, but with a resource that can only come through Jesus. Suddenly he fills your life to give it meaning and purpose. Because you see, your life doesn't end here. It goes on. And I just want to say something here. You know, we talk about eternal life. And I think sometimes we're a little bit remiss when we talk about eternal life. Because we talk about those people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ receive eternal life. That's true. Those people who do not accept the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens to them? Well, I've got some bad news because they also get eternal life. You might not have thought about that before. What the Bible says is that at the end of the age, there is a day of judgment that comes when everyone will be brought back to life. Everyone will be called to account. For those who are in Jesus, he says that he will take them and he will bring them into his kingdom. And for those who are not, they will suffer for all eternity in a conscious state. I think with a physical body to that as well. But they will be in this place of torture for all eternity. I cannot imagine what that must be like, and frankly, nor can you. But this is what Easter is all about. This is what Good Friday was about. This is what Jesus dying on the cross, saving us from our sins is about, buying us back, redeeming us, paying the price for us that we get the treasure that actually should belong to him. In order that we can have the life that is with him in all eternity, rather than a life apart from him 
in eternal punishment. That's the choice that's before us. And so this Easter time, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, rejoice in that fact. This is a wonderful day. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead and never died after that. Unlike others that were resurrected from the dead, they died again. Jesus didn't. He lives to this day and will do for all eternity. And that proves that if he can do it, that it's possible for you as well. I mean, you've got to believe that, and it takes faith. But that's what faith's all about. If we choose to ignore him, turn our backs on him, he says, you know, you might think you're escaping for a while. But one day, he says, I'm going to catch up with you. You can run, but you can't hide. We're going to find that in the parable of the net. As the net closes in, the fish think they've got their freedom until finally the net comes right around them and drags them onto the shore and the day of reckoning begins. We're heading for that day, all of us. The question is, what are you doing about it? Are you prepared to pay the price for the treasure, your life for his? Or are you going to rebel against him? Walk in the opposite direction from him. Turn away from the gift that he's trying to give you. See, the thing is that the Bible tells us that it's not his will that any should perish, but all should come to eternal life. That's what he wants. And for many of us, he gives us that choice that, that it's put out there before us. And it's so sad that so many say, I'll just walk away from that. You do so at your own peril. Sometimes it's a bit of a shock to realize that, you know, because we don't like talking about hell, we, we gloss over it, we, we don't fully understand it anyway. But it's in the Bible. Did you realize that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven? Do you realize that Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else in the whole of Scripture? He spoke more about hell than he did about love. And yet we mention all the other things, but we skirt around this one. So I'm sorry if it sounds a bit heavy and coming on strong today. But this is a serious matter that we must, must consider. But the joy is, and hold on to this, the joy is that if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, that he saved you, that his death was your death, that his resurrection became your resurrection, then you have absolutely nothing to fear and everything to look forward to. Let's pray.